Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, wait and see if someone's going to show up for live to ask some questions in person. Um, today, um, I'm just going to take five minutes to uh, talk about the problem set that I just returned, mostly because there are you're going to be getting some of the, the same questions on the test five. So, uh, and then my, my plan is to spend maybe not too long, but the rest of the time I was going to discuss um, the rest, uh, discuss the open-ended part of the programming assignment. So discuss how you might go about implementing shortest process next or hash response ratio next or things like that, okay? So um, like I said, let me just quickly mention something. Um, you know, again, uh, maybe two things. Uh, so one, first of all, about this first question, um, I mean, you definitely will get some questions with a schedule of processes and you're asked to show me what the resulting uh, schedule is. So what, what the um, uh, what, what the resulting um, scheduler does uh, given a table of processes and their arrival times and um, their service times or the burst times or something like that, right? So uh, please do, you know, don't, don't do something like say process one, um, uh, just give me P1 at zero and then P2 or here, P1 at zero and then P2 at 60, right? I mean, do show every one of these time, every one of the quantums that we ask for, whatever, the, whatever the, the, the size of our time slices that we're using for the simulation. Because, you know, if, if you, if you, if you do it the other way, if, if you just show me with kind of an implied that process one began at zero and then process two begins at 60, um, it's, it's tougher to actually verify that you're, you know, um, um, uh, that, that you're getting all of the um, events for a particular process schedule. Okay, so so fo follow the examples like this, you know, and and have every time slice for the system shown with with which process was running in that time slice, right? So if process one is running from time zero to eighty, you should I should and if our time slice is ten milliseconds, I should see eight time slices with process one filled in for those eight time slices from zero to eighty, right? Uh, but uh, anyway, um, despite mentioning this on Monday, so I mean, kind of looking back, I see that uh, normally I only get about 12, 11, 12 people watch the, the help sessions. So I, I got like three or four people completely missed this question, which, you know, may correspond to the people that weren't watching, aren't watching the help session. So, so again, I don't know if they missed this again, they, uh, but, but um um, some people were just not doing multi-CPU scheduling, okay? So if, if you have two CPUs, there has to be two CPUs that you show with processes being scheduled on them, okay? So the essences of this problem um, are that, you know, you get the same kind of process arrivals, but these processes, um, they, they're not multi-threaded. So, so if a process is scheduled to run on a CPU, uh, like on CPU 1, it can't be simultaneously running at the same time as CPU 2, right? Um, but yeah, given that, I mean, you know, we could do uh, the same kind of thing, but um, ask you to do a shortest process next with a multi-CPU system or, you know, or highest response ratio next, right? So, so the, we could certainly do any kind of scheduling um, algorithm that we talked about could be done on a system with one CPU or two CPUs or more CPUs, right? So, so you need to kind of understand how this works. Usually the, in this question, we say that there's a, a single common um, queue, ready queue that we put the process into, okay? So that, that was described here. So what that means is that, um, um, so the first time where that becomes an issue is something like at time five here. So at time five, uh, process A is actually finished, but at, at um, um, yeah, so, so we're using three, Q equals three, so, so three time slices. So at time five, uh, uh, C arrives um, at time five, like we show here, and B was also um, um, timed out, right? So in effect, we've got one ready queue with C on it and B on it, right? So, uh, you know, if you follow these rules exactly, you're supposed to, um, if, a, if a process arrives at time T at the same time that a, a process is timing out on the CPU, the process arriving comes first, okay? So that means that 
because B is timing out at time five and C is arriving, C would be on the common ready queue first. So it would end up being at the head of the queue followed by B, all right? Um, oh, and by the way, the, um, you know, the, these, these rules here for kind of disambiguating are really kind of an artifact of doing these simulations by hand. Um, and they're also an artifact that, you know, our simulations are using a, a discrete time, right? So in a real, what I'm getting at, in a real operating system, um, I mean, although it is discrete digital logic, down at the hardware level somewhere, it, it's really an analog system. So um, uh, you can't really have things happening exactly at the same time, or, you know, if they effectively are somewhere, something is going to happen that would disambiguate, you know, one would kind of happen before the other, right? But if you're simulating these by hand, you do kind of have to take these into account, you know, so to get, for example, to get exactly the same answers um, for our programming assignments that our textbook gives, gets, um, there is a similar disambiguation that if a process times out at the same time that a process arrives, our textbook always puts the arriving process into the system first. So like for round robin, always puts the arriving process onto the ready queue first, and then the process that's timing out ends up behind it, right? So if you follow that rule for the single CPU simulations, uh, for the examples from our textbook, uh, you'll get the same um, results that the textbook gets. Or likewise, uh, that's the way that all of the system tests that I give for the program assignment, they always, um, you know, process, uh, processes arriving always get processed before processes that are timing out, um, even though that's kind of a, a, an event that's happening simultaneously in these simulations. Uh, so back to this, though. So for a multi-CPU system, if you have two CPUs, um, so like, like I began discussing here at time five, so what I showed, we've got two CPUs, but we've got a common ready queue. Um, and as I've already discussed, on the front of the ready queue is process C followed by B. And those are the only two things on there, right? But at time five, both CPU one and CPU two were idle because, you know, CPU one was idle for a time cycle already. CPU two is idle because it's process B just timed out because it ran its three time size quantum, okay? But, you know, another disambiguation for this multi-CPU system is we say that CPU one always schedules first if they're both idle at the same time in these simulations. So that's why, you know, it's most correct going by these rules that uh, C ends up being scheduled on CPU one um, because it arrived and got put on the ready queue first. And then B, which timed out and got put on the ready queue second at time five, gets rescheduled essentially to run again on CPU two. So it, it so it looks like it just kept running on CPU two here. Right. All right. But you know again, you know, for those people that uh, the, I mean so people look like they did a lot of work, but they were just doing it what with a single CPU, right? Which is kind of bad. So you know I feel bad that you did a lot of work, but but you, you have to understand what's being asked for you um for these questions here. So um, but yeah, so if you're asked for three CPUs, make sure you have three CPUs and a common queue and you're following any rules to disambiguate simultaneous things happening um, like we talk about here. So, and do give me also another thing. I mean, you know, give me every one of these time slices. So we just had discrete time slices in, in one time units here. And, and also, you know, another thing I should be able to tell which processes are running in parallel on the different CPUs, you know, so I can see immediately from this format that process C was running in parallel with process B on CPU one and two respectively, right? Um, oh, and then, you know, maybe I'll just do one more here. So, you know, I, I showed what why C and B got scheduled at time five. They would have both been scheduled for three time slices uh, for, for a Q equals three, okay? And, and actually that would have been the end of B. So B finishes off, off at time eight. It ran its full six time slices here from two to eight. But at time eight, you know, um, D has already arrived and also E arrives. Okay, so D arrived first. So D should be at the front of the queue, followed by E, uh, and then C um, timed out here. So, so you've got D at the front of the queue, then E, and then C. So that's why D gets scheduled on CPU one, and then E gets scheduled on CPU two. And then uh, E doesn't end up running its full three quantum. So um, C then gets scheduled um, uh, to run, finish off it after E runs for two times. Um, 
All right. So anyway, I, I think the schedule is correct given these rules here, but you know, you can check it by hand if you want. If you have any questions, let me know on that. Um, all right. So let's um, let me wrap that up and let, let me go ahead and move on to the um, programming assignment here. So um, I want to I want to go ahead and open up my assignment five here. So let's, um, let's close this folder off here. I want to come back to this, but um, but I, I mostly want to just just give a little bit more details uh, here. Um, you know, this might only be about thirty minutes here today. We'll see. Of, of um doing the um the open-ended part okay so let me see here um let me bring up the assignment description now uh, for assignment five here so on monday i got you started on that um i'm not going to repeat that for for time here but um after, you know, uh, so I'm talking about after you've kind of gotten the main um, scheduling system, so the missing functions working, and you got basic first come first serve. So if I didn't mention it before, I mean, after you get task five completed, when you run the system tests, you should be, um, the. I mean, not only should you have all the unit tests passing, but the first come first serve um, system test should also be passing if you've correctly gotten um, all these missing member methods implemented and have fully enabled the um, scheduling system simulations here. All right. So that's one thing you ought to look at. Um, on Wednesday, I, I showed getting started with this. So I showed um, copying the first come first serve file and adding it to the build system. Okay. So just to um, quickly kind of recap on that. All I did when I did that was I, um, in the file explorer, you know, I, I did like a, a copy of the header file, first come, first serve, pasted it, I renamed it to, um, I used the feedback scheduler. So I re renamed it to FB scheduling policy. Uh, likewise, I did the same thing, made a cop did a copy paste of the first come, first serve CPP file um, and renamed it fb scheduling policy.cpp right um, and then we just did a, a global search and replace um, so replace first come first serve scheduling policy with feedback scheduling policy right so that the name of the class change um, and in the header file there was one place where uh, there, there's a slightly different so these these header um, 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 guard function if def functions uh, you should also change that in the header or else your build won't work correctly we have you have to do that uh, change the name to the you know so if you're doing shortest process next you want to change it to spn scheduling policy whichever you choose you'll have to do a global replace both here um, and also in the source file right so, so the, the file that you copy from first come first serve and renamed it, you also need the global, global search and replace first come first serve scheduling policy to the scheduling policy, uh, the name of the class that you want to um, implement. Once you've done that, um, you need to get it added to the build system. So the, the only thing I think you really have to do, if I remember right, is um, you need to add your new one to the end of the assignment sources, which was like the very first or the very second um, make file variable in this file here, right? So basically I added FB scheduling policy.cpp to my list of sources, being careful to make certain that the line before that has a backslash on it so that it's actually a continued line there, right? Once you've done that, if you do a build, so I, I, I'll do this, I think this is where I ended last Monday. So if I do a build, the thing to check for um, is you're, you, your system should be correctly building and compiling the test and the sim executables again, but you should see that the file that you added, the, 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 the scheduling policy, so FB scheduling policy in my case, is getting compiled from the source file to an object file, um, and that file is being linked in with all the other object files to create the test executable, 
and it's being linked in with all the other object files here to create the sim executable, all right? Um, and then one final thing I showed um, on Wednesday, um, there's a few more things that you might have to do, but um, um, eventually, if you want to use your new scheduling policy um, in the assignment five sim file, there's one place in Maine where um, um, it uses from the command line um, the, the, the first command line argument. Um, it's supposed to be the policy name. So you would have to add in like an else if, you know, so if you're doing shortest process next, you would use SPN um, as the mnemonic for shortest process next. And you should have called your class SPN scheduling policy, right? So, so you, you would um, create a new instance of, of your SPN scheduling policy by, by dynamically creating it using the new keyword here, right? So this gets passed to the scheduling system main simulation as the policy to use for the simulation that you run then, right? Um, oh, and you do have to include the header file. So I don't have an SPN scheduling policy, but you'd also have to include your um, your .hpp file that you created uh, at the top here um, in order to get this to compile there. All right. So that's basically, um, you know, so I kind of, I, I didn't give this, specific steps here for the open end part, but that's basically to get you started. That, that was the things that you need to do on this first one here where I talk about copying the, the header and implementation files. Um, and you also need to um, add it into the build system by modifying the make file. Um, so let me just, and another thing I mentioned last time, but do make multiple commits. I mean, try and make certain you do at least a commit after you get your file building, even though you haven't done any implementation on your new policy yet, but that that would give me evidence that you you know <clears throat> uh, were um, making small incremental steps, right? So so you know if I see multiple kit commits, I can tell um, at least you did like this. You got the got it added into the build system um, and you get your file created, right? And you might want to do commits after doing each one of these individually, or or, or each one or two of these, or something like that it would be. A good thing, right? Okay, so um, you can implement any of the scheduling policies that the textbook gives. Um, um, it's probably a little bit late for me to say this now, but um, I mean, if you wanted to implement something else, uh, that probably would have been fine, but you would have had to describe it to me. Um, but um, um, some of these will be a lot, well, it will be easier to do than others. Um, so like, if you want to do the feedback scheduler, you know, for a challenge, you know, um, <clears throat> I would certainly encourage you to do that. That'll help you understand a lot about our textbook's description of the feedback scheduler, but that would definitely probably be the, the toughest one because the feedback scheduler has, you know, the way it's described in the textbook has multiple ready queues, which kind of corresponds to, I think of it as kind of an indirect way of specifying the priority of processes. So when processes initially arrive for the feedback scheduler, they're at the, the highest priority, but every time they time out, they're going to get put to a lower queue until, you know, you might only have four um, uh, ready queues. Um, so if, if it works way down the lowest one, that ends up being kind of like the lowest uh, priority in the feedback scheduling system. So I'm not going to talk any more about that one, but, um, um, you know, I'm certainly possible to implement. Of, of the other ones, you know, you could you could do short process next, short main time, do a round robin scheduler again, um, or do highest response ratio next. Um, those were the only other ones besides first come first serve um, and the feedback scheduler that our textbook talked about. Among those, I mean, you know, um, it's it's short process next, probably is, is obviously going to be the easiest one because short process next is non-preemptive, like first come, first serve. Um, and the way that you make your um, dispatching decision is you just have to know which processes are currently ready. Um, and um, then uh, you pick the one who has the shortest 
um, service time, right? The, the, the service process implies you're looking at, we, we call it the service time. That, that's the total amount of time that the process runs. And right? so the shortest process is the shortest process that's currently ready and, and waiting on like your ready queue um, um, that has the, the smallest um, service time, right? So our, our textbook, I'm not gonna bring it up, but our textbook shows that dispatching decision as taking the minimum process, the, the one with the minimum service time. Right, TS. So um, let's imagine um, how you might implement that. Okay, so um, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through here and change my names or, or create this for in each individual one, but let's imagine that that I did SPN instead of feedback. Right. So for that, um, again, like first come first serve. You have a ready queue, but one thing you might do is you might you might keep a ready queue the same way that we did it here. But you'll 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 want you'll need to search on that ready queue. So it's not it's not the process that you put first in the ready queue that you would select for the dispatching pro, um, um, decision, which is what first come first serve does, right? So my um, my file here I haven't modified from first come first serve. So if you look at the dispatch, it if the queue isn't empty, it just takes the one at the front of the queue. That's that's what first come first serve is, right? Um, so uh, an easy approach to this is um, instead of using a queue, uh, you could just use like a list, a list of process identifiers for, for source process next. Um, and then the reason why you do that, so, so you know, again, source process next is non-preemptive. So, you know, you, you, you could do the same thing that first come first serve did. You would just always return false if you're asked if the current process should be preempted or not. Um, you could do a similar thing that we did here for first come first serve to make certain that, that your ready queue is empty. Um, just swap it with a, a list instead of a, uh, an empty list instead of an empty queue. And you can do the same thing for a new process. So, you know, th this is called for your scheduling policy every time a new process arrives. So you could just add that to your list of ready processes. All right. So the difference would be, and, and also you could check if your list is empty and return idle because if it's empty, um, um, there's nothing to schedule. So you, you have the same answer that the CPU should go idle if I'm asked to dispatch um, if there's no process currently ready. But otherwise, then, then it's a little bit more complicated here. So you need to iterate over all the processes, all the process identifiers in your list and search for the one with the smallest service time, okay? Um, so remember, um, um, if you don't, if you didn't watch the video uh, about uh, using like the standard template library, Things. I mean, you can iterate over lists relatively easy, easily. So you could do something like um, use the new, what's it called, the new value-based iterators. Um, you know, something like that would would get each process identifier off of the ready queue um, list. Um, you know, it would iterate over those. Right? It wouldn't actually take them out of of your your ready queue, but um, um, each time through the loop, you'd have the the, the, the items in that ready queue list uh, one by one, right? And once you have that, um, you can um, look in the process table um, uh, to look up the service time for that process, okay? Uh, There might not have been an example of this. So here, you know, you'd have to do something like um, um, you'd have to go back and look at your scheduling system. Um, um, so you need to be able to ask your scheduling system uh, to get the current process table. So there is a method called get process table, which was created exactly for this. It returns returns a process pointer, but it's really returning the that that process table, the, the same process table you had to use for the first four. Um, uh, first four or five tasks for this assignment here, right? So, um, so just as an example, you know, um, before your loop here, you could have gotten a handle to that process table.
by calling the get process table. So again, like in our previous assignment, um, all of the policies also have a handle back to the main um, system simulation called sys, right? So you can call any of those member methods um, on sys. Um, sys is a pointer um, to, a, to a scheduling system um, instance. So this would return your process table. Uh, and then from that, uh, so this, this is really just um, um, a pointer to the array, to, to the base of the array of the process tables. So you can do the things like you did before. Um, access any of those member values of the process table, like the service time, right? So, um, so that'll be as far as I go here. But you know, so what you'd have to do is you'd have to start with like the service time being either like a really large value, like maybe max int, because remember the the surface surface. Um, service time in our um, scheduling system class, uh, you, have, you have to look at the, um, uh, the, the, the process structure to, to find all the member variables for the processes in this process table. So the service time is a simple integer um, here. Um, so you could start off with that being like, um, um, you could remember like a, um, um, uh, what the largest service time was that you've seen so far. Um, and you could start, start like, remember which process ID had that largest, um, um, the smallest service time. Or you want, you want to find, you want to remember the smallest one that you had so far, right? Um, so anyway, however you normally would search like a, um, a, a table to find uh, the entry that has the smallest, the minimum service time, that, that would, Give you. So if you do that correctly at the end, you would know the process identifier among the processes that are on your ready queue um, that has the um, small service time. And that would be what you would want to return from um, 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 this function here, because this function is, is expecting you to return a, a process identifier, which is the next process to dispatch. So. Um, So the that is really all you need for if you want to do shortest process next, right? Um, because uh, pretty much everything else is about the same as first come first serve, since uh, since shortest process next is also non preemptive. Um, let's talk about shortest remaining time. Um, So short remaining time uh, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be too much more difficult. So if you're looking for a slightly more of a challenge, or if you get short process next done um, and you want to implement uh, maybe for some extra credit or something, uh, you can also try short remaining time. Um, so short remaining time is pretty much like a preemptive version of short process next, um, as we talked about in our textbook. So what you need to do for short remaining time is every time you're making a dispatching decision, you you have to look at the the processes that are currently ready and you, you need to pick the one that has the not 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 the one that has the shortest service time but the one uh, you have to look at how much time it has remaining to run and you want to pick the one with the shortest amount of remaining time on it all right um so just as a hint on that there is actually a remaining time number variable for processes um, and remaining time does get updated. Um, so the remaining time should be correct for all the processes that are currently in the process table. So where that happens is um, if you look at the scheduling system, let's just search for it. Um, So, so if you look at the remaining time, so initially when we load a process table here, uh, remaining time just gets set to the service time because initially before the process runs, it's remaining time, uh, it has to run um, its total time. It hasn't run anything yet, right? Um, um, either when we load a process or when we 
create process tables at random, uh, does that same thing. And then it gets updated um, here when we simulate a CPU cycle. Okay, so every time a process runs, um, it's time used, it's use time gets incremented and it's remaining time gets decremented, right? So that means that you can um, search the processes um, and look at their remaining times if you wanted to implement shortest remaining time, right? But it is a little bit trickier because shortest remaining time is a preemptive um, uh, a preemptive scheduling policy. So what that would mean uh, in this case is that um, um, you couldn't just, uh, if, if, we, if we go back and look at uh, preempt, you would actually have to do something different for preempt than what I was talking about. So shortest remaining time preempts on new process arrivals. Um, so one way you could do that is you could like add a flag to your process so that every time new process is called, you set that flag um, and then um, then you use that flag to determine that uh, um, the, the next time preempt is called uh, at when a new after a new process was called, you return true and then you reset that flag and return false. Um, although another way to do this, there is a method in the scheduling system. Um, called um, um, did process arrive, okay? So this does a similar, well, th th this basically, uh, you can also use this from the system to implement the pre preemption by process arrival, okay? So if, if you look at the implementation of did process arrive, let's find that one. Um, you, you could, th this would be another way you could implement the preempt um, method uh, for short remaining time. You could just, search the process table by hand to see if any process arrives at the current system time. That's what the did process arrive is doing. So it searches through the process table, checking if the arrival time for a process is equal to the current system time. If it, if it is, that means that a process is arriving at the, at right now at the current system time, right? So anything that needs to preempt on process arrival, um, if this returns true, that means a process is arriving and you need to preempt, right? So, you know, you could have just basically redone this, or you could just reuse this method for shortest remaining time preemption. So, um, so for this and um, the um, um, is uh, HRRN, HRRN also is preemptive. I have to, I have to go back and look that up. But um, so anything that are, that preempts when a process is arriving, you should be able to do something like that um, and instead of um, um, trying to figure it out by hand or something more complex. So, so you, you can ask the simulation if process um, ar arrives right now, whatever the current system time is, um, and it'll return true if something arrives, which you want to preempt on, and return false if nothing is arriving. And, and that's the kind of the answer that you need for this, right? So uh, anyway, if you do that, then um, whenever you're asked to make a dispatching decision for source remaining time, it should be pretty similar, but um, you would, um, so, so the dispatch message should be called for you correctly um, if, the system determined it needs to preempt the current running process, right? So all you'd have to do is look through the um, processes that are currently ready and find the one that has the shortest remaining time um, and return that, okay? So, um, oh, I, I think I, I did miss one thing here. Um, um, another thing you have to be careful about is, um, so what we were doing for first come first serve is we were just taking the process that was at the front of the queue and we, but we removed it from the queue, okay? But so likewise here, when you determine the process that that you're going to return back, uh, that should be dispatched, that should be run next, um, before you return back that process identifier, you need to remove that from your ready queue like we did here. But you can't do a pop. Um, you'll have to do something like call, um, you'll have to call, if you're using a list like I suggested, you'll have to do um, um, something like a, um, 
uh, like an erase. So again, we, we showed those before on, on some of the um, uh, videos where we talked about using standard template library containers and things, but uh, you ought to be able to erase the element that has the value of the PID from your list. Um, so. So, so yeah, like I said, source process index, source main time. Um, let me skip over to HRRM. So, so source main time is a little bit more challenging, um, but um, um, if you reuse some of the stuff that's given to you um, in the main class, um, it shouldn't be too much tougher. It's pretty similar. Ron Robin then um, and HRRN would uh, HRRN also. Um, uh, I'll talk about that one next. Um, it ought to be similar to source main time, but you need to select the, the dispatching decision is going to be by among the processes that are ready. You want to select the one that has the highest response ratio. So you, you would, um, in theory, you would have to calculate the response ratios and select the one that has the highest one of those, right? And um, HRRN is also preemptive by process arrival. Let me confirm that, but I'm pretty certain that's true. Um, um, so let's look at our scheduling algorithms here. Um, so HRRN um, is, um, um, oh no, I'm wrong. So it is, it's non-preemptive. Okay, so that makes HRN, but actually might be simpler than source remaining time. So HRRN like source process next to get the same result that the textbook has, um, you can just always do false. And then all you have to do is make the scheduling decision based on, um, which one has the highest response ratio, where the response ratio is the combination of the wait time plus the service time divided by the service time, right? So if you can calculate the, the response ratio for the processes that are currently ready, um, you can just look through the, those ready processes and select the one that has the highest of that value, right? For HRRN. Um, and again, if you, if you look through the, um, um, the processes in our scheduling system, um, there is also like remaining time um, and, and service time. There is also a response time. So response time um, is being kept up to date for all the processes. Um, and this is targeted so that you can implement highest response ratio next um, um, rel relatively uh, uh, simply here. So, um, So if we look for, the response ratio, there, there's another method that's called in the loop of you know, every time step for these simulations that updates the process statistics. Um, and that's where the response ratio is being updated. And so for every process um, that has started, but it's not yet done, um, we update the wait time. So the amount of wait time is the difference between the current time and when it arrived, right? So, um, 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 so once you have the wait time, then you can figure out the response ratio, which is service time plus wait time divided by service time. Right? So anyway, that this should be being updated. So that means that um, if you wanted to, to implement HRRN, um, since it's non preemptive, you know, you do the same thing like first come, first serve. You, you'd always just return false. You could keep a list, like we were saying, of ready processes. Uh, and then again, you do something similar. Uh, you'd have to search through that list to find the one with the maximum, with the largest response ratio. And response ratios can't be less than one. So you could start off with like a dummy response ratio of zero because you know that nothing can ever have a. Um, um, a smaller response ratio than that if you were searching for the largest one then. So. Um, uh, 
All right, and kind of finally, so, so we discussed all these uh, um, source process next, probably the easiest. Uh, HRRN might actually be a little bit easier than source main time since it's also non-preemptive, um, but source main time, if bo both of those, if you use the uh, member variables that are in the process table um, and the member, some of the member functions that are given to you by the scheduling system, that are there in order to implement like church main time and HRRM. They shouldn't be too much more complex than short church process next. So round robin um, um, would be a little bit more complex. Um, so if you're looking for a little bit more of a challenge, uh, you have to add in some extra things. So round robin, uh, we, we've, you know, you, you're already familiar with that. Like, you know, our second program assignment, we actually were implementing a round robin scheduler. Um, there are hooks. So one thing to do round robin is you have to know what the time slice quantum is that you're going to be using for the system so that you can know when a process should be timed out and returned back to the end of the ready queue. So um, so for round robin, you might want to go back to using a ready queue because it, like first come first serve, uh, your dispatching system, if you correctly use a queue is going to be whichever process has been on the queue the longest or whichever process that is at the front of the queue, right? So, so that would be what you do for Ron Robin. But you'd have to add in some extra stuff in order to, to correctly know when you need to preempt or not. The easiest thing to do for Ron Robin is you could add in like an, another member variable. Um, whatever you want to call it. But, but basically, um, if you know the, the, the system time slice is five, whenever a new process is started, you would want to set the time slice remaining to be whatever the system time slice quantum is. And then you want to decrement that every time um, a CPU cycle happens, okay? So how do you know? Well, basically, um, preempt is called for every CPU cycle. So um, inside of preempt, you could be decrementing this. And then once it gets down to zero, you would know that the current running process has exceeded its time slice quantum. So, if that, so when this gets down to zero, you could return true for preempt. Otherwise, you would just decrement that and return false, right? And then, you know, like I said, for a new process, you would add the new process onto the end of your ready queue to do round robin. Um, and um, um, you would um, um, set that time slice quantum to be the system, whatever the system time slice is being used. Um, uh, that not, might not be everything. So one other thing, you do have to um, be careful of if, if a process is actually finished. So, you know, a process could be finished before um, um, is time slash quantum um, actually um, um, is used up. So you, you have to be checking for that somewhere as well in here. Um, um, and then there's, oh yeah, then kind of one final thing on that um, and then maybe I'll wrap it up. But um, um, there are hooks meant to be used for the time slice quantum. Uh, so in particular, if, if we go back to look to the assignment five sim, the main function in there, um, it allows for either three or four command line arguments where the fourth one is gonna be a time slice quantum, right? So, so if you wanna pass in a, a time slice quantum, you know, so if you wanna use sim, round round sim, simulations with five as the system time slice quantum, you could use that fourth parameter. So that should normally only be used um, by um, scheduling policies that need it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we had an example of that um, here. So the most obvious way to use that would be to modify the constructor uh, for your round robin scheduling policy or any scheduling policy that uses the system time slice quantum and pass that in when you actually create your instance of your round robin scheduling policy, right? So that would mean um, if um, 
you're implementing round robin scheduling policy, you, you would modify your constructor um, to have a constructor that where you pass in a single parameter, the, the, the system time slice quantum. So you could remember that. So you'd probably need uh, another member variable. So you need the system time slice quantum as well as the current remaining time um, for the running processes um, time slice. So. So something like that, where you pass in and remember what the uh, the, the time slice for the system um, is being used for uh, in the simulations there. So. Um, all right. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up here, uh, although I'll stick around uh, if people have questions here that have, have joined um, the session. But, uh, oh yeah, there was one more thing I wanted to mention now that I'm thinking about it. So um, it would be good, like I was saying, to, to have multiple commits, um, um, maybe after implementing each one of these, at least maybe a separate commit when you implement the preempt. So the preempt is usually gonna be the more most complex thing you have to implement, although, uh, sorry, not pre um, dispatch, but both dispatch and preempt might need a little bit of extra work depending on which uh, scheduling policy you decide to implement. Um, and then finally, you have to enable the full simulation. You do have to uh, add in the, the things, I already, I already talked about this, but in the assignment five sim, um, you'll need to add in um, an else if statement um, so that you create a new instance of your scheduling policy based on the command line argument. Um, remove that one. One other thing about this, though, is that um, the system tests, so the, the, the script that runs the system tests um, is in the scripts subdirectory called run system tests. So by default, uh, it actually tries to run system tests for um, everything. Actually, I guess I don't have any system tests for feedback. So we'll see, I might, I can add those if somebody does implement a feedback schedule, but it does have system tests for first come first serve, HRRN, SPN, SRT, and round robin. I and mean, all these, like the process table one is the process table one from our chapter nine of our textbook. So these should be the expecting the exact same results. Um, that we see in our textbook, um, like you know, if you run run Ram Robin with the process table one with a time slice quantum of four here. So, but um, what I was going to say is that um, if you the the final like twenty points on your assignment, so so uh, if you go and look at your feedback pull request, um, when it runs all the tests here when it when it does the auto grader um, um you'll get 80 points if you get you know all the unit tests passing for the first four tasks or for the first five tasks uh but yeah the final 20 points is a result of um passing the system tests but you know if you only implement you know shortest process next uh you, you'll be failing you know hrrn sr2 so you know for completeness i, I might if, if people don't do this, I might do this for them, but for completeness, if you wanna see if you're getting the full 100 on GitHub, um, in this case, it is okay to modify the, the system tests. You know, So if you are implementing shortest process next, you could just go ahead and remove um, everything but the first come first serve and the shortest process next. So if you do that, then, um, When you run the system test, it'll only be running, you know, first come first serve and whatever it is that you're trying to implement. So, uh, at a minimum, you have to have first come first serve and your system tests for um, the schedule for the policy that you implement passing to get the full twenty, uh, the last full twenty points on the assignment here. So.
Um, all right. Yeah, so um, I was going to maybe talk a little bit more about some things. So there are more elegant ways to implement like these things, like using priority queues. Uh, but I'll just leave. I'll just mention that uh, I think the example solutions, if I end up posting them for these, use priority queues basically for um, shortest process next and shortest remaining time, um, and HRRN. So um, that's. Um, another route that you can go instead of by hand, like searching through all the ready processes to find the one with the shortest service time or whichever one that you're implementing. So, um, all right, so let me go ahead and in the session here and post this video, um, but like I said, uh, I'll stick around here and see if there's any questions, uh, but otherwise that's it for the session.